So welcome, and we are going to be discussing a conservation project that we have been working on here for a number of years at the Enchanted Forest Sanctuary, which is part of Brevard County's Environmentally Endangered Lands Program. And this started around the same time we were doing the conservation of this property and getting it into a status as a sanctuary, we had the issue with the weevil coming into our state and starting to destroy uh, plants in the native habitat. What we're gonna talk about how that all coincided and what we've been doing since the onset. But for the Enchanted Forest, we have a little over 400 acres that are conserved and it was the flagship sanctuary for the Brevard County environment. And we have a beautiful, diverse habitat that really was enhanced by our Mesa Kamics and the opportunity to see this particular plant, the Tillandsia utriculata that we're going to be talking about as a canopy cover. And the sounds and the sights in the forest have changed because of the reduction in this native plant and what's happened with the introduction of this weevil. So let's go into the slides. In the background, you can see one of our plants that's in inflorescence. And this is one that actually seeded in a cedar tree that was near my office and sent seeds out last June. So there's good stories. Uh, some of them evade this problem that we have with the weevil. So we have a history of what happened with the weevil coming in and why the Save Florida's Bromeliads Conservation Project started. And it all happened at the turn of the last of the decades of the 1900s. And Broward County saw an influx of this weevil through plants that had been uh, introduced into the state from Mexico. And the growers that had them were identifying these plants being eaten. Their other bromeliads were being eaten and they were seeing that they needed to contact the agricultural agency and they came in, but it was a little too late because the weevil by that time had expanded to native populations. And we're gonna look at that distribution and what happened uh, here in just a moment. By 1993, we had research going with Dr. Howard Frank and Ron Cave. And this is where uh, Dr. Teresa Cooper comes in very importantly to be a uh, a person who led a lot of the work that was done along with, with her uh, doctoral study and working with uh, Dr. Frank and Dr. Cave and others came into looking at a biological control. And they traveled to Belize, they traveled to central Mexico, they traveled looking for what kind of uh, native uh, controls were, were in the native habitat of this particular weevil and brought back Frankie Fly. This was a uh, 2011 project, but by the time we had seen generations coming in, we weren't successful with uh, reproduction of this particular fly that's invasive or predatory to the, the weevil. It wasn't successful in Florida, whether we have much different uh, environmental constraints on that type of reproduction, but research continues. We're, we're still looking at what we can do. In 2009, we saw these initial studies showing the weevil had spread to all ranges of the native plants. And we saw 97% of the species gone. And we'll look at a map within that time frame, 1989 to 2009, we'd lost 97%. And then we met up with Dr. Cooper in a, a couple of projects she was working on in the forest. 
she was all over Florida and the native ranges trying to identify which areas were uh, really getting the decimation. And we started to join in with her at that time to assist and form what we're now calling Save Florida's Bromeliads Conservation Project. And it's a series of volunteers, scientists, and research uh, entities across the state in the native ranges. And we'll look at that in the next slide. We see the weevil coming in and our native populations being reduced. Here's that uh, 18 or 19, 18, 1989 timeframe Broward County. So it was really extensive in that time frame through the nursery industry. And in the next year, we see it hop to the West Coast. Now that could have been by plants being transferred there and sold, but the weevil is it's pretty tricky weevil. It's expanding in the next year to the South. And the following year, it's intensified in the West Coast and we see it coming up the East Coast. We see it coming down into the 2009 timeframe, expanding across the entire range of the plant. The Northern range is somewhere above uh, Volusia County, not much further North and then across the state. So we see weevil in all of these areas by that time frame. The picture on the left is, or is the weevil itself. There's an adult. You can see it's the typical weevil structure with the uh, rostrum. It's got that little nozzly uh, nose. And then we see on the right, the destruction. This is where we have a problem. When they lay the eggs in the base of our Tillandsia utriculata and other uh, native species, we see that weevil uh, pupa is voracious and just takes over and eats the entire base of the plant. And it doesn't survive past that. So our approach was, what can we do to at least do a conservation project and keep what's left of the plants alive. And Utriculata was the plant that we picked because that was the one that's most predominant in the forest, the one that's most attractive to the weevils and the one that was seeing the most destruction in our uh, native forest here at the Enchanted Forest and across Brevard County. So, we see this plant has some issues with uh, its longevity anyway. It takes a very long time for it to grow and disperse seeds. And in that process, it dies. So it is not a plant that you can take cuttings of or is going to pop like other uh, bromeliads do. It is simply seeding and dying in most cases. We have seen some instances where there are pups and uh, we're trying to figure out why some of the plants are doing that and others are not. So our objective with the, this is to uh, save these plants from the infestation, find a place that we can conserve them to the point that they will produce seed and then let us collect and distribute the seeds. So in this, we've distributed distributed a uh, series of methods that we're doing, including uh, garden structures for the very young plants. When they're young, they're not attractive to the weevils. We see that they have to be a certain uh, growth before they're attractive for the weevil to fly in, lay eggs, and then just start that larval destruction of the plant itself. And We've also built uh, holding cages where we have used an insecticide and sprayed the plants that are more mature and ready to go into inflorescence. And finally, conservation cages that are rather large. And this is where our vulnerable plants go and have the opportunity to grow and produce seed. Uh, we're also working with the seeds in distribution in a couple of different methods. And we're gonna look at some of those pictures later on. But right now we've just started a new one where we're trying different substrates, different barks and different um, 
uh, trees to grow them on, as well as dispersing them out into the forest. And in doing this, we're also very concerned with what the wild population is doing. So once a year, we go on a wild population survey. And Dr. Cooper had been starting that from way back when. And we're, we're evaluating that data against all of our initial data to see what's happening. What we have to be aware of in the special considerations in this project these are considered endangered species in the state of Florida, and we must work under permit for handling. So it's the same as any other exotic uh, issue that we have. We're not collecting plants from other sites, bringing them in and conserving them. We're instructing people how to do that in their own uh, habitat, and we're working with other other areas within Florida that are doing the same thing as we are doing. So it's across the state that we have people that are working and trying to conserve these plants and keep them alive. So cradle to grave is including seeds to the inflorescence and the dying of the plant and us at least getting a chance to get those seeds back out into the habitat. Here's some really cool shots that Dr. Cooper did of the weevil itself. And this was back when she had a laboratory down in Fort Pierce. She was able to work a lot of the, the life cycle of the weevil and look at what happened to it. Um, at that time, we were collecting uh, pineapple tops. We were working with pineapple tops also in the forest to do them as an attractant to see if we could bring in the weevils gather more of the weevils and the larval state and the pupil chambers to bring to the laboratory for her to work with. And we see that destruction in the, the middle picture. You can see the tiny picture of the egg uh, at that being laid, and that was actually on a pineapple leaf. But then we can see that larva is actually doing so much mining and, and detriment to the the structure of the leaves that it's killing the plant. By the time it's gone into its cocoon and chamber, it brings it to the, the really wonderful stage of this insect. I absolutely love the pupil state. It's so horrific looking. They, they, and then it's, it's gonna turn out as an adult weevil, but it just seems the pupa has that really horror story, the Stephen King look to it. Where as a larva, they're kind of cute. But as a larva, they're very destructive. At pupil state, they're, they've kind of calmed down and they're just waiting to, to morph into the adult and then go and lay eggs. So we learned a lot from the studies in the lab and Dr. Cooper has a lot of great information about them from her studies over the years. So let's see what happens with Metamasia scalazona and what we're doing to keep our plants free from it. Here are some pictures of our garden structures. So we decided, and in the, the uh, trail map, you can see the red dots are our six garden sites. So that is where we have distributed these different garden structures. And our idea was to come up with something that would replicate where the plants would be living in the air or in a, an airy situation uh, as the the young plants usually get into the, the treetops or along the, the branches and the trunks of different trees, mostly oaks. Uh, we've seen them in cedar a lot and uh, the sable palm too they, and pine. They're They're very adapted to growing into a bunch of different trees and habitats in the enchanted forest at, at the rate that we've done the wild studies, we've been able to see where they're going. So what we did as a great scientific experiment here was use cedar, because cedar is really long lasting in the environment. And our intention is to have these garden structures out there to bring these plants up to the point that they are a medium-sized plant and we can start looking at the next 
process of protecting them. So using the cedar boxes, we did one that was deeper, about three inches deep. And they're all a foot by a foot, so 12 inches by 12 inches. And then we did an equal amount that were shallow cedar boxes. And then we did a series that were made with triangular mesh. And there were 90 total structures deployed throughout those six sites. And we have an equal amount of the structure types in each one of the gardens. And we were working with collecting plants from the forest floor, anything that had fallen out of trees, had uh, distributed itself to a uh, post-storm situation or however they are falling out of the trees to the forest floor. And we collected tiny and small plants and the tiny were under two inches uh, at the longest leaf length from the base to the longest leaf. And the smalls were up to four inches. All in all, that should equal about 1,377 plants in those 90 structures. And you can see all of that trail area is about five miles. So we had great task in going out to work in any of these gardens. We have a, a trekking situation. They're off the, the native paths. So we're going into deeper parts of the conservation area of the forest and the gardens are hidden away from the public themselves. And because of, of storms and other changes, the trails that we make to go into the, the conservation areas and the garden structures sometimes get a little fun. So we have adventures every time we go out there to try and find them. Yes, we've done some uh, GIS mapping. So we finally have some really good uh, mapping as to where these gardens are. But when you're out there and it's changing, it, we don't think about Florida having big changes, but we have a lot of growth. So those trails getting in there chains, you're still kind of navigating your way in there to find where your, your plant structures are. So garden structures, keeping them clean. We go and check them. We do measurements. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, or a few slides in, because now we're going to talk about what happens when we find plants out in the forest that are starting to go into inflorescence. We have a way to conserve these as well. And it's very important that we do find those. And one of the things that a lot of our volunteers know is if they've found one, they can bring it back to our main education and management center, and we can start that application. Safari is the insecticide that we use. It's a deterrent and it helps to keep weevils away from any of these plants that are vulnerable because the weevils will even lay eggs in the plants that are starting to inflorescence. So we can lose those very rapidly. Now the holding cage that we use back at the center is one of our older cages and it's a, a preliminary to getting one of these plants that's going into inflorescence into the conservation cages, which are much larger, and we give it a two week period. One of the things we want to be sure is that we're not introducing any of the weevils into our main conservation cages. So there's a couple of things we have to do as we're working with these plants. Even if we found a bigger plant that's not into inflorescence yet, we want to conserve them. So we do the application of safari and after the two week period, you can tug on the leaves. There's a way to, to figure out whether they've been infested or not. And you can see signs of stress. You can definitely tell if you have larval damage because the whole system of the plant starts pulling apart. We'll see some pictures of that coming up. So there's a time frame for spraying, holding the plants, making sure they're safe to go into that next step of the process, which is our conservation cages. So originally we had a plan, Dr. Cooper had this in her mind, that very tall cage that you see in the middle with the uh, red and white striped tape around it, the tallest one, picture this cage, in the back, and it's a little over 
I think eight feet tall. This cage came to us from Gainesville in the back of a little Ranger pickup truck. So picture Dr. Cooper driving down I-95 with this thing rallying around the back of, of her uh, truck and then us driving it into the forest and removing it and placing it into an area which was quite comical because it was very sandy. And once we had driven in there, we had a little bit of difficulty driving out. <laughs> there was enough sand and weight that we got the truck stuck pretty well and then had to get another truck to pull it out. But the cage got in there without any damage at all. And that was our first bring in a cage from outside. She built that in her backyard in Gainesville and brought it down. We decided the next step was to build them at the forest. So pictures above that are showing us in the workshop, actually putting together the next cage that's right next to it. And again, we're using cedar, we're using a uh, cloth that, the not even a cloth, it's a very fine mesh steel wire that the weevils cannot chew through. We have found that these Houdini weevils can chew through and get into just about anything. Plastic is no deterrent and some of the, the nicer uh, pool screen mesh that you have is not a deterrent. They can chew right through it and get into your plants. So this is a very stronger steel wire uh, structure that we've put together. You can see it took a whole bunch of us working to, <laughs> to get that cage put together and then deployed out into the forest. And we tried those in a low and shady area off of the trails. And after the first set of hurricanes, we, uh, we had some issues with the, the site that we had and we moved those to a higher, uh, more airy place where the, they exist right now. And that seems to have done a great deal of good for growing the plants inside the cages. So we're always working on construction process improvements. And we see that we had another uh, great grant that came in for uh, the West Coast and they had this cage built. We found a wonderful uh, woodworker, a friend of, of ours who is really great at uh, engineering and designing things. So Noah came up with a cage where you can actually walk inside of it. And that one went off to the Carlton properties and it's, you can see Dr. Cooper standing inside of it. So it's a whole lot easier to work in. We didn't have to climb over or worry about breaking through the screens with this particular construction. And we saw that this now uh, met our goal and our ideas of keeping those most vulnerable plants safe. So these cages became our way for doing that. And the next step of the process is gathering the seeds and getting them off into the forest in different areas and into some of the garden structures where we're actually growing them on burlap. So the picture on the very top, we see that little detail that's pulled out is the actual substrate that is burlap. The seeds were smeared across that. We used watering processes and watched them carefully. And that's about seven months of growth that you see on that little detail. In the lower right hand, you see a result of putting the seeds across the substrate of an actual living oak tree. And this is two years worth of growth. Growth. So those little guys we call recruits, and those are gonna be giant wild pine in about 15 to 20 years. So it takes a little bit of time. Now, uh, the most fascinating and uh, fun thing that we found out was that you can use some mechanical devices for dispersion. And yes, that is Alex Robinson working with a leaf blower. And we see Laura on the right hand side pulling seeds off of one of the inflorescence and 
holding them up and then Alex would elevate them with the leaf blower and blow them up into the canopies of the trees. And this was a process we benchmarked from watching what the Selby Gardens uh, personnel were doing with the project they used at the Fakahatchee Strand. And that was uh, a result of us conversing and having uh, annual meetings. We get together with all of the safer bromeliads uh, groups and talk about what we're doing and what's happening in our different areas. So monitoring the dispersal sites keeps on going because we can see two years of growth and that's as big as you're, you're getting. We have a long time to look at these and to hope for them to grow. So that whole cycle and the research that's done resultant to that is working from seed dispersal to the garden structures, to the conservation cages, and doing some scientific work as far as plant measurements, measuring the longest leaf lengths, comparing those, and doing the health checks where we're tugging on the leaves to make sure nothing is happening with them. The biggest thing is keeping them watered during a situation where we're in a drought, getting out to the gardens and out to the, out to the, the uh, conservation cages now is very easy. That's very close to the conservation management education center. So we can get there pretty easily. We just have to haul a lot of equipment and water. Our biggest and most intense work is done when we have hurricane evacuation. For the last three years, we have taken the plants out of all of those garden structures. And remember that trail map we were looking at earlier, that's us going out there and pulling those 90 structures out of the forest, bringing them into a screen porch area of the management center, and then coming back and reinstalling them in the garden areas where they need to be. Extremely labor intensive, but we uh, did that as a, a method to make sure uh, we wouldn't lose any of the gardens. We, you never know where a tree is going to go down or what's going to happen during a hurricane situation. Our wild counts and our looking at the field conditions is inserted into our data. We keep logs of what's going on. And seed collection, again, we're at a point, we've got the plants in those conservation cages. We can go in once they have uh, produce the seed and collect it and do our dispersion methods. Here you can see when we were back looking for the weevils themselves as they're growing, we were taking apart any of those cocoon structures and looking at whether we had a larval state or a pupa in there, and containing those and getting those to Dr. Cooper so she could continue working with them. Uh, coming back to the center and writing down all of our data. On the lower right-hand side, we're digging into one of the plants that was found dead on the forest floor. And this is the situation. When we first started seeing this happening in the forest, that was the concerning situation as you walk the trails. You would see just this pile of the, the leaf structures of these dead plants and look up into the canopy into that uh, mesic hammock and not see the utriculata and see clear sunlight coming through. So massive environmental changes to these particular habitats we know had to be happening. And there they were like so many dead soldiers laying across the trails. So once in, or twice in a lifetime or hopefully in everyone's lifetime, you get to do something that comes to the rescue of these fabulous species that, that we know so little about and uh, that are there to take care of and learn. And lovely, lovely, lovely times come when you write grants and you are awarded funding because then your project can really take off. For so many years, Dr. Cooper drove to the Enchanted Forest from Gainesville 
on Wednesdays, sometimes Wednesdays and Saturdays. And then she was going across the state to the other centers that she was studying as well. And I don't think she saw much of her home for those first years that the project was in work. So with the help of this conservation grant that we got last year in June, and it's been just a year, and it's very exciting to have had this awarded. I did not get to go to Crystal River to uh, be in the the, the uh, conference and, and get the, the word that way. I had just had another hip surgery, so I was down for the count and I, I really missed out on that, but it was wonderful and, and we're so proud to have this uh, Sea Rocket chapter, which I'm wearing my shirt today. Yay! Hello, Sea Rocket. And the Florida Power and Light Next Era Energy was the funding source for this $5,000. At this point, the conservation cages have been constructed. We see Noah, our at the bottom picture, he's the gentleman in the blue shirt. He came up with a new design. We asked for some improvements so we could really walk across the bottom of it and make it sturdy for those hurricane time frames. We really want to make sure these don't blow away and that everything stays set through the hurricanes that we don't have to do anything special to these cages. So his workshop, back at the workshop, he came up with a new engineering plan. It still has the full door for access, but you can see as he delivered it, we had it in pieces and then we were able to fully assemble it, put it onto the EEL program's trailer and use their Kubota tractor to bring it up the hill and get those in place. So we couldn't do this without the help of the EEL program and all of the staff at the Enchanted Forest. That's Debbie working with Laura to put screening on. And there was many, many fine people who helped us with getting this all done. And having that equipment through the EEL program made it all happen so much easier. These new designs allow easier access. Their location is very close to the existing cages. We're, we're hope, we don't want to test it, but we're, we're hoping, and the engineering should be there, that these structures will survive hurricane strength winds. Teresa survived I-95, so we're hoping this will definitely survive some hurricanes that we don't see this year, but we're ready for it. There's more space in these structures for plants and what a great investment in conservation. Thank you so much to the Florida Native Plant Society and to Florida Power and Light and all of the people that were involved in, in making that grant become a reality for us. This is our result and it's wonderful. And we have a little bit of education we're doing with that. These interpretive signs are getting ready to be installed. And we have three phases that we're talking about. These are now at our, our printers and they're going on to very hardy exterior display that will last uh, with a 10 year guarantee. So sun and wind and rain and all of that won't disturb the surface of these interpretive signs. And we hope that the stories that they tell will help to educate when we're not there to tell the people what they're seeing when they walk past these cages and what they're seeing when they come into the forest and see some of the dead plants still coming down out of the trees on the forest floor and the trails. And we hope that our interpretation of the project will invest people in thinking about volunteering. We're working on making it easier for our volunteers because that's one of the key processes to making this project work and to keeping going with a lot of what we're doing. So hopefully these beautiful signs will get people to come back into the forest and talk to the management there and to Patty Rendon. She is the volunteer coordinator for the Enchanted Forest. And we're hoping to get back in there on a regular basis as well. We've got some plans coming up 
to really make this easier for everyone. And a separate branch of the project involved using fungus. This was one of the byproducts of the research in the laboratories. And Bavaria bassiana was the process that we used. That fungus was taken into medium-sized plants that were placed on these cedar sticks. And thank you to David Humphreys for making all of those happen. Angie Howell was the major trail finder for all of the remote sites that we had these plants installed. And we can see that we did a half and half. 90 plants had the Bavaria uh, applications once a month, 90 plants were control. And our idea was to look at what's going on if this particular fungus would be a deterrent to the weevil and whether or not it was changing the uh, phytotomata that's any of the life of the base of the plants, there's water in there. Some of the bigger plants can hold up to five gallons of water. They're I know that because I took one off of a tree to put it in the conservation cages and it inadvertently dumped on me. <laughs> that was refreshing because it was a very hot day and the water was nice and cool, but all of the little uh, phytotomata that lives in there, I don't know what fell on my head, but quite fine. So Talanzia utriculata, medium size, were the subject of this trail plant research. The plants were installed over a period of a year, and we went out in those time frames to do the monthly applications of the fungus. And we ran into an issue. There was something we referred to as the Great Massacre. As we were going into the, one of the trails, we found all of the plants were chewed off and fall into the floor and killed. And what we were able to do, again, this was with the help of the eel program, they have the wildlife cameras, and we install those along the trail so we could get a good look at what was going on with the plants. And we saw that it was squirrels. Squirrels were coming in and chewing the plants right off at the top of where we had tied them onto those sticks. We tried wire wraps as a deterrent to the squirrels once we found out that was the main course and that seemed to be helpful but then last year we came into Hurricane Dorian and everything was removed from the forest. We brought everything in and got it into the security of the screen porch area and after the hurricane, we decided to put those medium-sized plants in conservation into the cages. And we hope to come back to the research once we've investigated the data from the initial research. We want to come back and work more on that type of a project again. The slide on the uh, top is showing uh, from the looking at it through the microscope, you can see there's larval states of different insects in the phytotomata. This is a sampling of the water taken out of those trail plants. I think there's some mosquito larvae in there and there's some other really cool things. And this was one of the bigger projects that we would want to really keep looking at is what life exists within these plants. What is their main purpose for growing different habitats for different insects, reptiles, and birds, what kind of a, an influence that phytotomata has on the bird populations. So there's lots more questions and lots more research to can continue and carry on with the plants. As we're going through the project, we're finding out that there's things we can do. We've, we've met the challenges. We've all been through the heat of summer, uh, pulling wagons, dragging water, bringing all the research data, the measurement books and the tablets and everything out into the field, into these remote areas. And we've seen the issues we've had with hurricanes and 
creating the removal and replacement uh, for any of our garden structures and trail plants and securing the cages. And what we're finding out is that volunteers aren't growing on trees. We're hopefully not falling to the forest floor like some of the plants have. And <laughs> we want to make sure that we can continue and work this process in a safe and easy manner. So we have plans in work and I've heard from our board of directors for the Sea Rocket chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society that we are going to meet this Sunday and go and look at a process that will allow us to share, use space at the Enchanted Forest. There's a nursery site there and we are going to work on development of a plan to where we can put our garden structures. So we would take all of the structures that are still in the forest back into an area that's just steps from the parking lot, steps from the management area and easily accessible by all volunteers. And we hope that this is going to improve our volunteer uh, participation as well as our educational process. We'll be right there with any and all of the groups that are coming in once we do uh, reinstate school processes and group tours. We'll be able to go in and talk about what we're doing with the research and make it a whole lot easier for everybody. So we're looking forward to that very much and we'll meet this Sunday and try and get going on the plan to get all those plants out before any storms come, yay! <laughs> and with that, I want to say so many thanks for saving Florida's bromeliads. To the Enchanted Forest Sanctuary, to the Florida Native Plant Society, to our local chapters, to all of the people across our multiple areas that are working on research, the Selby Gardens, Naples Botanical Gardens, and all of the individuals who are keeping track of how these are working in their own backyards and their own properties. We're, we're very thankful that we're able to be a part of this greater process to put conservation at the head of a volunteer program. And I want to say a great many thanks and acknowledgments to all of these people. And if I've left anyone out, I sincerely apologize. Uh, I know there were, there were other people I saw in, in our uh, videos that are still on the website. But the entire staff of the EEL program, current, past, and future, because they're going to be there to help us out no matter what. It's a great program. We can't do this without them. They've got the, the big trucks and all of the equipment. And we're very, very uh, thankful for being there at the Enchanted Forest and being able to do this. The beautiful photos all came from Angie. Uh, and Kathy and Dr. Cooper and mine are the fuzzy ones that came off of the phone. So <laughs> anything that was not uh, very clear, you can attribute to myself. And I will then turn us over to questions. I think I've left enough, enough time for us to ask any questions as we're looking at our giant weevil on the palm of uh, I think that's on Angie's hand. <laughs> Do we have any good questions? Well, we don't have very many questions. Uh, I believe you did address Tim's question. Yes, Do squirrels yeah. damage? Do squirrels damage mm -hmm. the plants? Yeah. Yes. So it was kind of like we felt like we were putting out a smorgasbord or a buffet once we figured out what they were doing because we had put these trail plants at our shoulder height so we could address watering them and looking into the plants and, and uh, taking any of the samples we had to take out of them. So all the squirrels had to do was basically climb up a little bit on the tree and then just start munching away. It was as if we'd done golden corral for squirrels in the Enchanted Forest. And once we figured out the wire structures around them, that was very helpful. They, they didn't seem to come in and do any more damage. 
So we want to we want to ensue with a new set of, of medium-sized plants that we can do the same fungus investigation. But Teresa's writing paper on what results we found right now, project that has been done. So that's a future project. It's a lifetime endeavor because the plants are so long in growing to maturity. Any other questions? Uh, Tim also would like to know what size mesh you use for your cages. For the, the cages that are the uh, conservation cages, it is a steel, I want to say it's like a 32nd. It's tiny, very tiny, and it's steel. I, I'm telling you what, we need to do a field trip. So I'd like to do a, a trip to the forest and be able to show everybody with a live type of presentation where everybody can call in again. That's in the future. I think it will be a lot easier once we get things back towards the building. The Wi-Fi doesn't work that well as you're getting out into the forest. And uh, even doing the GIS mapping was tricky at first until we got a little bit better uh, equipment because we're in such a remote area. Um, but I think we can do some better field work once we get the, the um, structures out of the, the forest and back by the building. And we can look at those uh, plans. If anyone needs plans on how to build those and wants them in their conservation projects, I can definitely recommend Noah Hosberg and Sarah Noah uh, Construction as a, a place to have your uh, cages made. He does fantastic work. Uh, Martha? Yes. Yeah, okay. My name's Steve Provost. I'm a long term uh, Bromeliad Society member, and I've been down to the Enchanted Forest. I know Teresa and Dr. Frank. Um, I guess what I see that you're doing there, you're really just working on trying to maintain the plants and grow them from seed so you can reproduce them. I know the, I know we've given up on the, on the, uh, using insect control on it so we're looking at other things and i'm sure you're say you're coordinating with selby on the work they're doing now yeah our last conference we had at selby last fall uh, i believe we went in november right. the uh were you at that one where... no i was not i, oh, I was it, not able to attend it it was it was fantastic because Dr. Frank and Dr. Cave attended and we had some really, uh, I think in, the, in the, the field of genetics, there were a lot of the new college students that were there with, the, with Selby and with uh, Naples Botanical talking about the use of genetics and noting that the plants that grow in Belize are not affected and, and the uh, interpretation of what the plants in Belize have that's different than the plants in Florida have and what kind of genetic cross could happen. Much like, I think what Dr. Frank was referring to was a process where he, maybe it would be akin to what that had been done with the Florida panther and genetics helping save what we have left of the Florida panther. Um, so I think the work that's going on with that is, is really at a higher level at this point. And they were looking at what type of funding would have to happen and when and where that all could take place and what would get started with it. But I'm hopeful that these younger uh, doctoral candidates who are in school right now have the wherewithal to get these these types of studies done and find the funding to support them we may have a chance right right i think you i think that committee that's formed is continuing on of course to deal with oh, yeah. those so. yeah Thanks. so i'm looking forward to the next conference and hopefully it'll be out of any uh, dangers of any hurricanes this year or any other uh, issues that would keep us from meeting. 
because it was awfully nice to get together with everybody over there at Selby. Uh, and we look forward to being able to do that kind of uh, walks and talks through the forest as well. Erin would like to know, uh, what is the time between seed collection and seed dispersal? How long can the seeds be kept in storage? Well, that was another uh, piece of the, the conference study at Selby. Of course, they have a lot more potential for studying the, the seeds. And at first we were working a very urgent uh, dispersal and taking the seeds and dispersing them as soon as we were collecting them. Um, we did that when we saw the pictures of us using the leaf blower that was a uh, collection that day and dispersal that day. In the past, we didn't have that much uh, uh, support and we had put some seeds into bags and had contained them for a little over six months. So some of those you saw on the substrate with the using the burlap in the, um, the garden structure area and just recently Laura did some back at the forest on the, the uh, nursery tables that are on different uh, barks and we'll see how those work and those were ones that were contained in uh, paper bags for uh, about six months but our, our ultimate goal is to get them as soon as they have started to seed and get them out of conservation cages and out into the forest immediately. Tim would like to know, is there information available for individual residents to perform conservation of these plants on their own property? For example, I have nine oaks on my property. And do you have, if there's an a active population of the plants in your property, that is something that you can definitely take a hold of and, and keep an eye on and I know that in the, the areas to the west, I think they had permits that Donna, who was the head of that conservation project, was able to take them to her home and actually work with them out of the house. But it would take permitting to take anything out of the Enchanted Forest. And that, that would be something that you probably would not see happening at this point we we had looked at it and because there was so much involved with uh, documenting what processes were happening at the home front and whether we were just introducing another area for lots of weevils to come and eat um, we weren't we weren't confident with that at this time but that could happen in the future definitely but if they're in your own population keep an eye on them uh, where I worked at the Sam's house, which is on a totally different side of Brevard County, I have a cedar tree and in that cedar tree, there are beautiful plants. There's everything is going on in that cedar tree and one cedar tree all by itself and knock on wood, the weevils haven't made it over there yet. If I had it in my own yard and I was saying I was working out of my backyard, I would use the insecticide safari and spray the plants that were there and make sure they got to adulthood. I think I've got about 20 years left, so I can do <laughs> that. That leads right into our next question. Mike says he has three plants in his wing dome in Seminole County. Should we be applying the safari herbicide? And it depends if they are at that age that they are vulnerable, if they're over. 14 inch size that would be something to consider absolutely and there um, is this a private area or a public area he said it's his wing down so i'm assuming it's private property his oh. private property okay yeah just keep them safe and of course we know we don't sell them we don't trade them they're not you know it's endangered plants so you have to follow all those rules and be very diligent about that. I think um, one of the really good tools that we had for going out into the field, we had this really cool little uh, laminated chart with all the different species in Florida. And these were done way back when uh, University of Florida had funding for it in the Division of Plant Industry. 
and a grant from Gulfstream. So I think these are kind of rare too, but there's a really nice talk in the beginning of it about how you can protect plants in your own habitat, looking out for destruction of habitat, of course, in development of areas. Are they going into a beautiful canopy and knocking it down for, for buildings? What, what are we doing to watch out for that kind of, of change? Um, looking at ornamental bromeliads, making sure that nothing is being brought in. Again, this all started because we were bringing in plants from another area that maybe got through the inspection cycle. I know the ag agents, there's not a lot of them. And sometimes it just was slipped through. You don't get everything cited. If that egg is so tiny, you're not going to see it. You know, if you're traveling, don't bring in bromeliads from other areas. And just keep a watchful eye out on what we do as human beings. We can do the most and we can do the, the best things. We can do the most damage, but we can also do the very best things. We have to balance that. It's our forest, we're the sanctuary stewards, so we keep eye out for everything. That's so great. Uh, Julia, I would you. like to know, how is the population doing statewide? Well, because we have seen that 2009 spread across all the uh, counties where the native ranges are, we haven't seen anything get better. We don't have anything that's controlling the weevil. We just have what we're doing as conservation right now. So conservation, conservation and preservation are the keys to survival. It's that dire at this point. It leads right into Anne's question. What's the status of the weevil in Florida? Is it still a threat? It is still a bi viable threat, absolutely. And as we're seeing invasive species finding, you know, the, the worst case, they would eat all of the plants and then have nothing else as food source. And what would happen to the weevil at that time, perhaps we'd see population decline, but we'd also have the extirpation of the actual plant that it feeds on. So they're there. Uh, Rory would like to know if squirrels prefer treated or non-treated plants. As far as the fungus goes, they didn't seem to have a preference for either. That was something that, again, with all of the research, we'll figure out what happens. And we know we do lose some plants to uh, rodent destruction in the forest, but this was just setting them up for them. They were, they were right there ready to eat. So... They seem to like them all. Uh, Julieta would also like to know, does this species occur in Puerto Rico and other places in addition to Mexico? Of the weevil, the weevil itself is, uh, let me see. <laughs> I want to say its main habitat is that central region of Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. And there, it doesn't cause damage to the host plants. It's not a, a, a deterrent. That's why they're studying to find out the plants from Belize, what is different about them genetically from the Florida plants, and what can we do to introduce genetics to make a change to the Florida plants. And Puerto Rico, I don't know particularly. Again, there could be an introduction from us bringing ornamental plants into another habitat that wasn't the normal range for the weevil. And I've heard mostly about what's happened in Florida. We received some support for this field trip idea. Yeah. So that's good. Good. Okay. And Barbara yeah. would like to know if she could get, if we could get an electronic copy of the info card that you presented earlier. Um, I, I would think it's, it's not, I don't know who has the original 
uh, I know when we got these, Dr. Cooper was like, here, this is treasure, don't lose it. Because there were only so many made and then they, they didn't, I don't know who has the original Barbara, but we can definitely scan this and try it that way. That could be another grant application. Yay. We love writing grants. <laughs> yeah, more information would be absolutely perfect. So we can find out about getting this one re reprinted. Uh, Greg Good would like idea. to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, this is a great idea. Uh, Greg would like to know: Is it known which other Tillandsia species weevils attack in addition to Utriculata? Well, the the work from Takahashi and what was presented to us by Bruce Holtz and Mike Owens and the research that they've done through that southwestern portion of Florida, the Guzmania species is about gone. So that was the other, it's very uh, beautifully uh, broad leafed uh, Tillandsia that is again, really attractive to the weevils. And those went first. Those were the ones that we saw. Let me see if I can find the pictures. Uh, the, on, our, on the uh, website that Teresa is still maintaining, there is a good comparison of a before and after shot through one of the the photo ops at the uh, and photo stands at Takahashi Strand, and it shows the population at optimal, and then the population after the weevil, and basically what you have is just the dead root balls of the plants hanging onto the uh, pond apple and the other uh, trees that are there in that particular habitat. It's not very pretty. So. Any of the broad leafed and uh, more succulent of the, you know, they're, they're leafy and delicious. So the larvae have a great food source and that's, that's what uh, attracts the weevil to laying the eggs in them. Erin would like to know, does the safari insecticide kill off all or most of the phytotomata? And that's the other uh, topic of conversation with the plant, what effect it has on everything growing in the uh, Tomato. So again, it's not something that you want to put broad base through the forest because we would ruin that relationship. Uh, and just in, and I would say we're we're doing that in conservation of of the habitat and what we want to preserve and and getting it back to a spot where we can buy some time before that biological uh, process is, is put into place that will save the plants without us having to put human intervention into it. And yeah, you wouldn't want to spray it everywhere. No, because you would, it kills. But the plants that we're putting into the cages, it's good. I know I mentioned that for people in their yards, but that's not a conservation area. And that's where you have to draw a line on whether you're working in a public site and working to the permit requirements. And that's that's where you have to look at the overall usage of an insecticide like that. And it isn't practical to try and get that into plants in a, in a, a natural environment because they're typically growing at a pretty good height. The canopies can be upwards of 30 and 40 feet above ground. And so you want to have a, a good way to get that broad spread into the plants. Anne and I missed what, what website link you just mentioned about Guzmania. Uh, Guzmania at the Fakahatchee. Those are the plants that were first seen getting really decimated. And right now, in looking at a, a photo of the, to get to the pictures, is safefloridasbromeliads.com. And there are some good shots on there. We're trying to conserve that website and get that into an archival situation. There are some videos on it that detail the work that we've done in the field and some interviews. Uh, also from the conferences, I believe Selby has uh, recorded uh, any of the, the conference lectures that have gone on. So I think there's 
some good information with the the Selby Gardens as well. Bruce Holst might have those available for everyone. I don't think they're broad based across a website at this time. Uh, but the work that we've done with Dr. Cooper has been conserved for right now. We're trying to get that into another site and make sure it stays uh, archived. Valuable information. Uh, Barbara says, there are areas where I live in southern Sarasota County off the beaten paths that have populations of these bromeliads on city property. Are there any plans to expand conservation slash preservation programs to include these types of areas to municipalities to handle? Or is this something a private conservation entity like FNPS would need to initiate with the municipality? Yeah, all of that. All, we, we do see a lot of people that participate in Sarasota. I'm not remembering outside of what they're doing at Selby if they're uh, because there were government agencies that were there city and government uh, municipalities attended the conference and were taking into advisement the different methods uh, for conservation so I believe there are efforts out there but definitely within Florida Native Plant Society there can always be a strengthening of that particular education and uh, conservation process can always grow. Any other good questions? Or shall we try to get to the field? I really am looking forward to being able to do that. And I'm hoping that we can uh, take a virtual trip and let you all see what's happening in reality. Uh, there don't appear to be any further questions. Thank you so very much. This was a pleasure. Thank you everyone for attending uh, this week's Lunch and Learn. And uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. And take care.